the prophet Amos had a prophetic message for the northern kingdom of Israel, but he roared that prophetic word from here in the southern kingdom, represented by its capital at Jerusalem. Judgment is coming, said the prophet of the Lord. Next, on the prophetic connection. One of the clear messages of the Bible is that God delights in taking ordinary people but doing extraordinary things with them. This is certainly true of the prophets of Israel. The prophet Amos was called from being a sheep breeder to being a mighty prophet of God. His book begins with these words, the words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa. Tekoa was a small village about five miles southeast of Bethlehem, 10 miles from Jerusalem. So this small village in Judea, in the south of Israel, Amos receives the word of the Lord, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Josiah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, I'm standing in what was the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom in the land of Israel. And Judah was the southern kingdom. And this occurred two years before the earthquake. And he said, here are the words of God through the prophet Amos. The Lord roars from Zion, meaning Jerusalem. He utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel withers. The top of Carmel is over my shoulder. This is the mountain range of Carmel, part of the northern kingdom of Israel. But Amos, who is from the southern kingdom of Judah, roars his prophetic voice, and it makes the mountains behind me wither because of the voice of God's prophet. The roaring message that came through the prophet Amos was primarily directed toward the northern kingdom of Israel. After the deaths of King David and King Solomon, the nation of Israel was torn in two. The kingdom of Israel controlled the north while the kingdom of Judah controlled the south. The Bible describes Amos as a humble herdsman and a sycamore tree farmer from Tekoa, located in the kingdom of Judah, just south of Bethlehem. Although he was just a simple Judean shepherd farmer, Amos was called to announce a very bold and disturbing message to the king of northern Israel at a very pivotal time in Israel's history. We know that when, when David and Solomon are kings, both Egypt and Assyria, which are traditionally the enemy states on Israel's borders to the northeast and to the southwest, contract. Once we get past David and Solomon, both these empires have a comeback, specifically the Assyrian Empire, even more so than the Egyptian Empire. And if you look at the geopolitical realities of what is basically the Book of Kings, you'll see that Israel finds itself sandwiched between these two world powers. Assyria tends to be the stronger one of the two and often ends up being the battleground. It's sort of like Belgium is between France and Germany, you know, in the, between the late 19th and early 20th centuries, which puts Israel in a very difficult position. And there are numerous stories in the Bible of, of, of Israel making treaties or being vassal. Israel is a vassal state, basically, of the Assyrian Empire, northern and southern kingdoms during this period of time until Assyria itself is overrun by Babylon both the northern and southern kingdoms will, will basically be vassal states of the Assyrian Empire, meaning while they will have their own kings and maybe their own tax system, they will un be under the hegemony of the Assyrian Empire. In approximately 760 BC, when Amos first brought his message to King Jeroboam, the northern kingdom had been enjoying a long time of relative peace and prosperity. Neither Egypt nor Assyria appeared to be posing any real threat. Amos's very upsetting message could not have been more unexpected or unwelcomed. But the book of Amos, considered to be one of the Bible's minor prophetic books, 
tells us that Amos unflinchingly delivered the word of the Lord. We call them the minor prophets, but there's nothing minor about them. They're just shorter. They're just packed with truth. And Amos is an incredible, incredible book that we can learn from today. You know, he was a nobody working out in the fields or something. And he, but because the Lord spoke to him, he gets the word of the Lord. He goes right into the ch channels of power and brings the, brings the word of the Lord. It's such an example for us today. Hallelujah. We need to be praying for our governments and praying, you know, that the Lord will open door that a prophetic word could come into the, the Parliament of Canada or, or the Congress of America or whatever. But Amos was a sheep, uh, had tended trees and was a shepherd and, you know, had nothing to do with the religious system, but God found a heart that he could, he could use. When God's message came to Amos, he was instantly transformed from humble sheep reader to courageous prophet. The message of Amos was that the time of peace and prosperity Israel was experiencing was about to end. Because of Israel's social injustice and religious pride, God was about to allow a brutal and terrifying army to invade with disastrous consequences. Generally, conquest in the ancient world was very brutal. Today we have Geneva Conventions and ideas of non-combatants. By the way, these are ideas that Judaism introduced into the world. It's only when Judaism and via Christianity, the ethics of value of life appear in the world that we have such an idea. In the ancient world, when you rebelled, it was brutal. You'd have, you, could, you would suffer a brutal siege. You can see, by the way, uh, we have an image, one of the earliest depiction of Jews in history anywhere as, as, a, as a graphic image is the, is the, the Lachish inscriptions, which are on Sanhera's palace from, from Iraq, which are scenes that are carved into the walls of his palace. You can see them in the British Museum which is the, the siege of Lachish during that rebellion of Sancherev when he attacks Jerusalem and it doesn't fall. What he first goes for is all the chariot cities, the major fortified positions that surround Jerusalem and Judea, and they fall one by one to his armies. And in that, you can see the picture of the siege, including the Jews impaled on these giant wooden spikes. And once the city fell, of course, everything was looted. and The people were taken into captivity to be sold as slaves, or it was very brutal. Toward the end of the peaceful reign of Jeroboam, a new and aggressive king rose to power in Assyria. This new king, Tiglath-Pileser III, was determined to absorb Israel into his growing empire. Although he did not live to complete this task, in approximately 722 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered and destroyed by the Assyrian kings, Shalamanzer V and Sargon II. Amos's dreaded prophecies came to pass some 40 years after he first uttered them. But this was not the end of Israel's story. God also gave Amos intriguing prophetic messages regarding the future of Israel and the entire world. Events that are only just beginning to unfold in these last days. At the end of the book of Amos, after all the judgments that are going to fall on all the nations around Israel today and then on Israel because of the, their rejecting the, the word of the Lord, he then says, but in the last days, he will restore the tabernacle of David, which has been broken down. Now, what is the tabernacle of David? It's not the temple. De David didn't build the temple. His son did, Solomon. The tabernacle of David is when David brought the ark up from down here on the road up to Jerusalem, where you drive now. When he broke, brought the ark, the presence of God back to Jerusalem, they set up a tent. And David used to go in there and sit in the presence of the Lord. You can read about it in 2 Samuel 7 and so on, where David would just, who am I, O Lord, and, and you, that you brought me this far? I was a shepherd. And so the, tab the tabernacle of David that's in the end of the book of Amos is going to be a revival of people that are desperate for intimacy with Jesus like never before. To soak in his presence, to listen to his voice, to cry out to him, to pour our hearts out to him. King David is such a, an example for us of a, of a true worshiper um, who was continually seeking God with all his heart. And even when he sinned, he would run back to God and um, always wanting to know his will to saying that he, he's, his, his chief joy 
is found in the Lord. I mean, the Psalms, I, I just, I live in the Psalms. I can't get away from the Psalms. So many of the songs that we sing are based because those, the, 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 it really expresses the longing of the human heart for that kind of communion. God revealed to Amos a time when the tabernacle of David would be reestablished in the earth, a place of worship where human hearts could intimately experience the presence of God. And according to Amos, this restoration would eventually be experienced not only by Israel, but also by many other nations. The restoration of the tabernacle of David is going to be the restoration of Jews and Arabs and ex-Muslims and Canadians and people from the Far East, all worshiping the Lord together as the one new man in Christ because he broke down the wall of division between Jews and Gentiles and Arabs and all the rest of us. That's why it's so important for us to have a, a revelation. We, we have a mandate even in this congregation here on, on, on Mount Carmel to be the expression of the one new man, of Jews and Arabs and other Gentiles uh, being built together as a dwelling place for God and the Spirit. It's the last verse of Ephesians 2, the chapter that speaks about the one new man and the wall of partition being broken down. It's happening now. and and. We worship together, Jews and Arabs and Gentiles. My wife's worship team is Jews and Arabs. You know, we try to walk out the, tab the restoration of the tabernacle of David, but who got the revelation of it? Some guy named Amos that nobody knew about, a real prophet of the Lord. And it, it, it thunders down the, 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 the centuries for us. For it, God said he's going to restore it. Now we're going to be part of it. We're going to miss it. Today, God is currently beginning to restore the tabernacle of David just as Amos predicted. And almost simultaneously, other exciting prophecies spoken by the prophet Amos are coming to pass in our days. Prophecies regarding the return of the Jewish people to their homeland and the restoration of God's people, Israel. the Bible, I discover that God chooses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And certainly that can be said of the prophets of Israel. Amos was a very ordinary man, but given an extraordinary prophetic task. We read in Amos chapter 1, the words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. So here we have the two kingdoms, the southern kingdom of Judah under Uzziah, and the northern kingdom of Israel under Jeroboam. And Amos is raised up by God. He's simply a sheep breeder, he calls himself, a very ordinary man. And in fact, behind me, the road to Bethlehem, and beyond that, to Koa, where Amos tended his flocks. And he would have been familiar with this area because he would have to come from there past Bethlehem to get to Jerusalem. And of course, like all Jewish people, to worship in the temple of God that stood there. The southern kingdom worshiped God in Jerusalem, but Jeroboam set up pagan altars in Bethel, and he wanted a different place of worship for the northern kingdom. And so Amos is called to go and challenge him and challenge the pagan altars that he has established and the idolatry that he has allowed in the land of Israel. And we read in chapter 3 of Amos, the judgment of God. Hear the word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. This is the same as, as saying, Israel, you have been my favored nation. I raised you up on purpose, if you like, to reflect heaven's light, to reflect among the Gentile non-Jewish nations, the laws by which man should live in relationship to his God. So I gave you favor. 
above all other nations. And you should have done better, and you should have known better, and yet you've turned time and again away from me, my commandments, and you've invited idolatry into the land of Israel, and thereby you have polluted it. So God says, therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. And as we move through the book of Amos, we come to chapter 7, and God, we know from the writings of Moses that locusts were one form of God's curse and judgment upon Israel. So Amos says, verse 1, chapter 7, Thus the Lord God showed me. Behold, he formed locust swarms at the beginning of the late crop, just as the crop was ready to be harvested. Indeed, it was the late crop after the king's mowings, and so it was when they had finished eating the grass of the land that I said, O Lord God, forgive, I pray. Now he's interceding for the people of Israel. He sees the devastation of the locust swarms, and he pleads with God, O oh, that Jacob may stand, for he is small. So the Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. He's seeing the visions of what God is going to do. Verse 4 of chapter 7, Thus the Lord God showed me, behold, the Lord God called for conflict by fire, and it consumed the great deep and devoured the territory. Then I said, and he pleads, intercedes again, on behalf of Israel, O Lord God, cease, I pray, O that Jacob may stand, for he is small. So the Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be, said the Lord God. And then, in verse 7, then he showed me, behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, a measuring line of what is right and wrong, if you want to think of it that way. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them any more. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with a sword against the house of Jeroboam, meaning the northern kingdom where idolatry has been planted under, under the king's reign. And he has encouraged it. So now, through the prophet, judgment is coming on the house of Jeroboam. And then, of course, we read, in Bethel there was a priest named Amaziah. In verse 10, Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel, meaning the northern kingdom, shall surely be led away captive from their own land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah, meaning flee back where you came from to Tekoa. There eat bread and there prophesy, meaning your prophecy means nothing here at Bethel. We, we're not prepared to listen to you. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is the royal residence. This is Amaziah, the priest, speaking. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet. But I was a sheep herder and a tender of sycamore fruit. Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel, and do not spout against the house of Isaac. Therefore thus says the Lord, Your wife, this is a prophecy for them, your wife shall be a harlot in the city. Your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword. Your land shall be divided by survey line. You shall die in a defiled land, and Israel shall surely be laid away captive from his own land. And that's precisely what happened. The word of the Lord through the prophet Amos came to pass. The northern kingdom was destroyed and its people exiled. But like all prophets, here and there comes an encouraging word. In the midst of the judgment and the devastation that follows, hope springs forth. By the time we get to chapter 9, we read these words. I saw the Lord standing by the altar 
And he said, strike the doorposts that the thresholds may shake and break them on the heads of them all. I will slay the last of them with the sword. He who flees from them shall not get away and he who escapes from them shall not be delivered. But then following the judgment, these words of restoration. Verse 11, on that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David which has fallen down and repair its damages and I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old that they, meaning the children of Israel, may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. Then these words, where locusts have devastated crops, read these words. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. There will be such an abundance of fruit and crops in the land of Israel when the blessing of God flows. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste places and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. And then these, this incredible guarantee promise from the Almighty God. I will plant them in their land and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land that I have given them says the Lord, your God. In the 21st century, the nations are pressuring Israel again and again to give up her land. But God says, I will establish Israel in the land and Israel will be secure in the land I've given them. Behind me and above me on the hills, the modern Israeli community of Mayale Adumim, situated actually on the road from Jerusalem, just behind the camera, and the Jordan Valley, and Jericho down below at the bottom of the road. This community sits in East Jerusalem, and in fact, on disputed land, part of the struggle, the on and off again negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian Authority in pursuit of peace. But look more closely and you will see that this community has sprung up out of the wilderness of Judea. All around it, the desert, our camera crew just ate in a thoroughly modern mall in this community. And as we drove through the streets, we saw the flowers uh, in bloom, a gorgeous community, but ironically in the middle of the desert. But this is a confirmation of what the prophet Amos said. And as his book ends in chapter 9, verse 14, I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. And we saw the gorgeous gardens of Mayale Adumim. This is in a disputed place, part of a bargaining chip, if you like, in the ongoing discussions, negotiations toward peace. But those who would remove this Israeli community or somehow change its status would do well to read the very last verse of the book of the prophet Amos. I will plant them in their land and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. This community began in 1982 with a handful of families Today, it involves many thousands of people living in the desert in fulfillment of the prophecy of Amos, but certainly of other prophets as well. Exactly what God said would happen. I will plant them, they will build in the waste places, and they will never again be pulled up, rooted from there. The Word of God, the prophetic connections from ancient Israel to modern Israel are being fulfilled before our very eyes. And we want the world to know that God favors Jerusalem and Israel. And we need to decide where we stand in this whole equation, for God or against God. But I want to be where Joshua was. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord.